Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. Uh, Tonight I would like to talk about the topic of the other. Um, Just before the year 2000, in the late 1900s, the last century, I guess, the um, Facebook had not yet been invented, and the forum for Buddhist, uh, shall we say, the Buddhist forum online was called Usenet. It was also called news groups, and uh, they had such names as uh, Alt Buddhism Tibetan, Alt Buddhism Zen, Alt Buddha, short, fat guy, and so forth. Uh, I'm still in contact with a lot of the uh, people who were on in those days, but most of them have moved on to terrorize uh, people in Facebook. It was there that I learned a lot about the dynamics of uh, online discussion. Having practiced uh, Zen in Korea, I'd never encountered anything like that. It, uh, but uh, in these forums, I quickly learned words like troll and flame war, so forth. And one of the things that is of interest is that in these Buddhist forums, it's quite common to see people faulting one another for not being good Buddhists, not observing right speech, right behavior, and so forth. Uh, You've seen it before uh, where there's a message posted announcing someone's departure from the group with a hit after the bell. It's a hit and run move. And uh, then you'll see ensuing comments like, this isn't an airport. You don't need to announce your departure and so forth. Uh, And to be sure, the Buddhist ethical teachings are fundamentally important, such as uh, right speech. And uh, these are uh, prominent in teachings such as the precepts, uh, the Eightfold Right Practices, the Three Poisons, the Immeasurables, Ahimsa. But what's often problematic about ethics, I find, is that they always seem to apply to the other. It's that other guy who's always caused us grief, whom we decry as not following the precepts, not using right speech, not equanimitous. It's always the other guy. But wait a minute, who is this other guy? And why is it so important to criticize him? Well, uh, the first thought that came to mind was, was Matthew in, Christi- in the Bible. Uh, Christianity, Matthew 7, 3 through 5 says, I'll quote, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So we might assume that Buddhism would have a similar admonition. Uh, Alaga Dhamma Sutra, uh, the snake simile, provides one. And the Buddha is quoted as saying, suppose monks that a man sees a large snake and with a forked stick holds it firmly down. Then he catches it firmly by the neck. And even though the snake would entwine with its body that man's arm, he would not suffer death or pain. And why not? Because of his right grasp of the snake. Similarly, O monks, there are some noble sons who study the teaching, and having learned it, they examine wisely the purpose of those teachings. To those who wisely examine the purpose, these teachings will yield insight. They do not study the teaching for the sake of criticizing, nor for refuting others in disputation. They experience the purpose for which they study the teaching, and to them, these teachings being rightly grasped will bring welfare and happiness for a long time. And why? Because of the right grasp of of the teachings. Uh, Therefore, O monks, if you too are reviled, abused, scolded, and insulted by others. You should, on that account, not entertain annoyance, nor rejection, nor displeasure in your hearts. And if others respect, revere, honor, or venerate you, 
On that account, you should not entertain delight, nor joy, nor elation in your hearts. So a prominent feature of our society is that there's a continual call for righteous indignation from one quarter or another. When it comes to social media or the news, how dominant are the voices asking us to join in condemnation of some celebrity, leader, influencer, nation state, government, nationality, power dynamic, and so on. If we could all agree on a villain to accuse, heap abuse on, wish violence upon or condemn or blame for everything under the sun, absolving ourselves, then we ourselves have established a contrast by which we can feel more virtuous ourselves, compassionate and more right than others. But are we really? And not only that, we can then join in the condemnation of others who uphold the views we don't like. We can feel even better about ourselves then. And all that was accomplished without lifting a finger to actually be helpful, caring, equanimous, or actually taking any personal responsibility for our actions. It's easy to get suckered into righteous indignation and turn that into resentment and wrong speech and wrong behavior. A famous uh, line in Bob Dylan's song, My Back Pages, talks about how we get drawn into enmity with those we oppose. In a soldier's stance, he wrote, I aimed my hand at the Mongol dogs who teach, fearing not that I'd become my enemy in the instant that I preach. So the point for us as Buddhists, I, as I see it, is how we deal with the notion of the other. This notion that characterizes the conflicts we encounter. The media that co-ops us into cheering for war or policies that penalize and punish instead of nurture and de-escalate. Of course, our first recourse in dealing with conflict is right understanding and right speech. The Vaka Sutra provides, uh, or the Vaka Sutta rather, provides the following guidance, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, it goes like this. Monks, a statement endowed with five factors is well-spoken, blameless, and unfaulted by knowledgeable people. Which five? One, it is spoken at the right time. It's spoken in truth. Three, it's spoken affectionately. Four, spoken beneficially. And spoken with a mind of goodwill. So what all of these five criteria depend upon, what they all have in common is what? An ability to see the perspective of the other. None of these can be done without consideration of the other's perspective and welfare. That doesn't mean that we necessarily accept the perspective as completely true, correct, or even palatable. But we do need to address the issue from the other's perspective if we hope to have any dialogue. Courses on negotiation put this forth as a fundamental premise. So why can't we use that premise in statementship, in our lives, in our practice? If we want to live and let live, we are just going to have to find better ways to disagree without being disagreeable. And I'll credit Reverend Jesse Jackson for that phrase. And that means stepping back from our own narratives and the dominant narratives we hear in our society. Things are seldom black and white. 
when there are actually two or more individuals or groups who are just really acting from their own self-interest. And the self-interest of one need not be incompatible or unreconcilable with the self-interest of the other. Recognizing the other's self-interest is the most effective place to start. Now, our own interests may be well-intended, but they often blind us to the humanity of the other. We can more effectively hear each other's concerns before things escalate and hammer out a win-win common ground solution rather than devolve into a zero-sum blame game and worse. And so I'll conclude with some famous and probably familiar words from the first chapter of Dhammapada. He abused me. He struck me. He overpowered me. He robbed me. Those who harbor such thoughts do not still their hatred. Those who do not harbor such thoughts still their hatred. Hatred is never appeased by hatred in this world. By non-hatred alone is hatred appeased. This is a law eternal. There are those who do not realize that one day we all must die. But those who do realize that we all must die, settle their quarrel. So how do we promote greater understanding among parties who disagree? Deep listening and a response that is timely, true, affectionate, beneficial, and spoken with a mind of goodwill. If there is misinformation, we respectfully address it. If there is clamor for evil, we counter it with wisdom and compassion and not with mutual enmity.